SCP-5236, Ethics Committee Inquest. Working at the SCP Foundation is never going to be that safe of a place. Despite all the safety precautions, the containment procedures, the warnings, and policies, the fact remains that anomalies are unpredictable and dangerous. A researcher might just be sitting there in their lab, working on a project, when suddenly they might no longer exist fully in this dimension. While sometimes this situation might just get contained as the higher-ups just shrug and move on with their lives, others might take a closer look to figure out what exactly happened. Most of the time, anomalies appear out of the blue, but sometimes their source can be identified a little more easily. Let's take a look. We begin the article with a notice that this packet of documents has been sealed to the Ethics Committee under Article 3 of the Foundational Mandate, and Level E5 clearance is required for access. The first document is a provisional SCP file for 5236 that was submitted for approval to the Ethics Committee, but was denied. The object in question is listed as SAFE and is described as an unstructured discontinuity in Einsteinian space-time, encompassing a roughly two-meter, four-dimensional cube of disordered space, also known as a tesseract. The rapidly shifting four-dimensional topology of the tesseract is inhospitable to ordinary matter, causing destructive malformations to instruments inserted through the boundary layer. While safe transit into or out of the Tesseract is impossible with presently available technology, visible light is able to escape it, albeit heavily distorted. It's located in a room in the Site-19 Chemistry and Chemical Biology Department, formerly designated as Laboratory S-1912B. The three-dimensional volume of the anomaly surrounds the space formerly occupied by a portion of a lab bench, a desk chair, and the bodily remains of senior technician Sasha Elliott, all of which are intermittently visible through its rapidly shifting surface topology. As the anomaly is spatio-temporally fixed to the reference frame of senior technician Elliott, and there is no known method by which her remains could be transported to a standard containment chamber, the lab has been repurposed for containment of the anomaly. The Tesseract manifested at 1029 MST on the evening of March 2nd, 2023, and the event was captured on video by the Site-19 CCTV system. At 7 p.m., Sasha and junior technician James Noroski are present, engaged in materials analysis and research. Sixteen minutes later, James closes his workstation and leaves the laboratory and building. At 8.25, Sasha departs the lab and proceeds to the nearby women's restroom, remaining out of view of the CCTV system for six minutes. When she returns, she appears agitated and her movements are erratic. At 9.38, she falls asleep at her workstation after a prolonged period of inactivity, with her sleep being notably restless. At 9.55, she abruptly awakens, screaming and falling out of her desk chair. She then makes several failed attempts to regain her footing over the next 34 minutes. Finally, at 10.29, she exhibits signs of a grand mal seizure for 13 seconds, at which point a bright flash of light overwhelms the CCTV system for another 4 seconds. By the time visibility is restored, the Tesseract has manifested in the space previously occupied by the technician. During a subsequent investigation, illegal narcotics were discovered in Sasha's Foundation-issued laptop bag. Junior technician Noroski admitted that he was aware of her ongoing drug abuse, yet chose to not notify his superiors. He further testified that she made a habit of working late at night, unsupervised, in contravention of the Foundation's safety policies. James was then reprimanded by the internal security department. 
We're not really given any reason here as to why this SCP file was denied by the Ethics Committee, as the containment procedures seem pretty simple, consisting of just sealing off the lab and letting it sit. A second document in the packet provides a bit more info, explaining that the underlying cause of the Tesseract's manifestation has not been made clear in the document, and if its origin is unknown, this must be made explicitly clear. The mention of Sasha taking illegal narcotics implies some sort of connection with the anomaly's manifestation, but insufficient information is given. The containment procedures must also describe what measures are necessary to prevent further instances from manifesting in the future. With that, the same researcher that wrote the first draft, Lee Corbett, wrote up the second one, noting that he's included mention of what measures should be taken should similar anomalies appear in the future, and removed the references to Sasha's drug use to avoid confusion and oversaturation with unnecessary information. This one was also denied, however, although we're not exactly given a reason why this time. All Lee really did was include a line that states that similar containment procedures are to be implemented in the event that any further instances of SCP-5236 manifest in the future. Due to suspicion of malfeasance among Foundation staff, as established in the document, the Ethics Committee has initiated a formal inquest into the matter. Under Article 3, Section 7 of the Foundational Mandate, the Ethics Committee has unrestricted powers of deposition on the matter, and the O5s only have access to the inquest information if the Committee grants them permission. Lee Corbett, Senior Researcher and Director of the Chemistry and Chemical Biology Department, is interviewed by one member of the Ethics Committee, Mallory Gleason. She apologizes for having to bring him in on short notice, and says that this should be a pretty quick matter, more of a formality than anything. She tells him that they're cleared for level 3 information, unrestricted, so he can speak freely, and then asks why he's the sole author of the 5236 file if it's not a biological or chemical anomaly. Lee explains that it's an unusual situation, as it literally occurred in his department, in one of his old labs. He did a lot of the early investigation and cleanup, and started drafting the document as he did so. He says that it was a horrible tragedy, and it felt only fitting that he at least write up the incident report. Since the math wasn't exactly the most complicated thing in the world, he decided to keep going and take care of the full document. She then asks if he consulted with anybody in the extra-normal physics department, and he assures her that he didn't need to, as it's far simpler than she'd think. Once you have a good grasp of linear algebra, the rest falls into place. She says that she's never had a head for numbers, and then asks him if the black moon howls, to which he promptly replies with, the clouds hush her cries and asks if there's anything else. The interview then ends, and his responses are then analyzed. He had said that he was more than capable of doing a bit of advanced topology in order to write up the SCP file, but a cursory look at his authorship shows that he has never written any SCP entry on subjects other than chemistry or chemical biology. Her consultation with the extra-normal physics department confirms that his description of the anomaly showcases a marginal understanding of the subject material at best, and borders on sheer technobabble at worst. As for his response to the Black Moon question, she writes that his negative reply indicates falsehood and deception. Poetic analysis suggests a deliberate lie on his part, with knowledge of wrongdoing. Finally, Lee was eager to leave the interview despite there being plenty of time to get to his next meeting. She notes that if she were his lawyer and this were a police interrogation, she'd duct tape his mouth shut before he talked himself into a felony conviction. So, not only is Lee hiding something deliberately about the anomaly and Sasha's death from the ethics committee, he's not hiding it very well. 
Outside of just straight up lying about his experience with these types of anomalies, it seems that the Ethics Committee has a rather unique method of interrogation, involving the popular Foundation code phrase, Does the Black Moon Howl? It seems that there isn't just a preset list of responses to that question, but rather it triggers an automatic response from the person that can be analyzed to determine a number of things about their behavior. Mallory then went on to interview junior technician James Noroski, also a member of the chemistry and chemical biology department. James is not sure why he's here, as he already had his internal security hearing, but Mallory says that she's with the ethics committee, and this isn't a disciplinary hearing. He's not in any more trouble than he already is, as she heard that internal security already had their way with him, leaving him on probation. Nothing he says here can jeopardize that though, and she'd just like to know a bit more about Sasha. James asks what she wants to know. She replies by asking what does he want to tell her, to which he says that he doesn't know. She then asks what does he not want to tell her, causing him to panic. Mallory assures him that he's not in trouble, and this interview is sealed to only the ethics committee, who don't have any say in disciplinary action. Their whole job is just to approve special containment procedures, so nothing he says here will get back to his boss, Dr. Corbett. James says that Sasha was good at her job, and worked really hard, practically living in the lab. Mallory asks if that's why she started using narcotics, and James replies that they're all pulling 70 to 80 hour weeks, but Sasha was working herself into the ground. The number of samples they have to run is insane, and he nearly got fired for taking a sick day. So yeah, she started using, and he doesn't blame her. And to James's surprise, neither does Mallory. She says again that she's not security, and she's just interested in why Sasha was high on the job, but she's not a narc. She then asks him what Sasha was taking exactly. And although James claims that he already told this to internal security, she wants to know as well. He confesses that it's called Thumper, like the rabbit, and it's both a nootropic and a stimulant. He's not quite sure what's all in it, but it's nothing like he's ever seen, with one pill able to keep you on your feet all night and you stay sharp. He's taken it himself, and admits that it works but you get the craziest nightmares when you come down. Sasha sold it to him, but she bought it from someone else, who makes the pills themselves. When asked where exactly she got it, James claims that he doesn't know, so Mallory asks him if the black moon howls. His response is, the winds crushed our throat, and Mallory asks him if he knew Sasha was going to get high that night. James counters that he isn't able to answer that, and Mallory concedes the point, ending the interview. In the post-interview analysis, Mallory writes that Site-19 records show technicians in the chemistry and chemical biology department working nigh impossible hours, with statistically improbable numbers of heart attacks and nervous breakdowns, and they're still getting some exemplary work done. This thumper drug sounds a lot like something out of the early studies on mixing class X nestic memory retention drugs and mundane stimulants, and she remarks that James looks like a walking skeleton. Analysis of his response to the black moon howl phrase shows a strong negative reply, indicating a deliberate lie. Additionally, the usage of a first person pronoun and a violent action against the subject indicates that while James is lying about the source of Thumper, his attempt at deception is due to fear of personal reprisal, something deeper than just disciplinary action. Later, 0510 pops into Mallory's office to have a conversation about the inquest. 0510 says that the Ethics Committee has authority over special containment procedures only, so she's unclear as to why Mallory is interviewing technicians and how there's even an ethical issue here in the first place. Sasha didn't survive the incident, 
so there's nothing unethical about shutting a dead body up in a cell, even if it is tragic. To be honest, the council thinks it's ridiculous that Mallory called an inquest at all, as there are more important things on her desk. Mallory and 0510 clearly go a ways back, and Mallory asks when was the last time she actually managed to strong arm her into dropping something once she got her teeth in. 0510 just says that she doesn't know what she's digging into, but Mallory says that she's not an idiot. Sasha overdosed on a cocktail of stimulants and Class X Nestics while sitting in a thomically active research complex. She had a nightmare, and it cracked through the noosphere hard enough to leave an exit wound in space-time. 0510 admits that that situation does seem possible, and Mallory continues. Class X Nestics are for remembering things that really, really want to be forgotten, like demonic anti-memes and cold pattern screamers. They're not for daily consumption, even at a low dose, and you can't exactly wander down to your friendly neighborhood drug dealer and get a baggie of esoteric super meth, nor can you walk out of the Site 19 pharmacy with a bottle in your purse. Mallory says that Lee, the head of chemistry and chemical biology, is dealing. He can get his hands on the raw precursors to nestic drugs before they're slated for the pharmacy, and she went through a few filing cabinets worth of old research proposals, finding that the department worked on nestic no-dos back in the day. Lee was a junior researcher on that project, and also entirely blew his interview with her. She used to think that 0510's poker face was bad, for a sociopath, but nothing like this guy. 0510 replies that that's a very serious accusation, and Mallory says that she's a very serious person. You can tell because she does things like call a sorceress a sociopath while looking her in the eye. This wasn't difficult detective work, as the 5236 revision that Lee sent back was basically a neon sign strobing that it was a cover-up. His research staff is also terrified of him, and James all but had a stroke when she brought up Lee's name. 0510, however, says that if Dr. Corbett is manufacturing narcotics, then this is definitely a matter for internal security, not the ethics committee, so the foundational mandate shouldn't apply here. In response, Mallory asks her if the black moon howls, and 0510 replies that the stars burn too bright. 0510 is shocked that Mallory would invoke the black moon on her, but Mallory says that not only did it show that 0510 thinks that this situation shouldn't go to internal security, it also shows that the mandate still holds, because otherwise she wouldn't be able to do that to her. Mallory says that internal security had James in for a hearing, but they never asked what drugs were found in Sasha's bag. They tried to sweep it under the rug before anybody could say the word Nestics. Given how sloppy Lee is, there's no way he could have kept this side gig under the radar without help from above. She might need to go pry the truth out of Lee's brain, but she doesn't get the sense that internal security is in on the take. If they were, they'd have to be doing something way more high reward than selling arcane stimulants to overworked techs. Internal security is where you want to worry about your chaos insurgency sleeper agents, not drug dealers. She asks 0510 if any of them are Chaos Insurgency sleeper agents, and 0510 admits that two of them are, yes. Mallory continues, saying that it's pretty damn obvious that internal security has some compelling reason to look the other way, and 0510 thought this was too far out of the mandate for the howl to work. It's also true that Lee's lab has been getting some amazing research done, even though his techs keep having nervous breakdowns and heart attacks. So she asks 0510 if the council is handing out designer drugs to keep technicians perky all night, or are they just turning a blind eye when Lee does it? 0510 admits that they knew about Lee's side project, 
and they were keeping internal security off his back, but the whole thing has always been Lee's operation, not theirs. Mallory doesn't think that 0510 would be a part of the operation, but hates that she's just letting it happen. She calls her a stone-cold witch, but never once has she seen her be cruel. She even came down here to intimidate Mallory in person instead of just sending a flunky, and she appreciates that, but she doesn't think the same can be said for the rest of the council. 0510 can't disagree with that, and Mallory says that she doesn't sound particularly heartbroken about her sinister plot being uncovered. Ten replies that it was never her plot, sinister or otherwise, and Mallory suspects that it was 053's idea, or the twins maybe. 053 came out of chemistry and chemical biology, and this plays right into 7 and 8's fetish for ruthless optimization. 0510 admits that she's correct on all three counts, as this was 053's directive with support from both 057 and 8. She applauds Mallory's clever deduction, as nobody else has put it all together. Mallory is, of course, surprised that 0510 is just admitting to all of this, but she says that this is an official inquest, and they're supposed to cooperate and speak truthfully. In truth, Mallory did an admirable job of gloating herself right into some very embarrassing information about some very dangerous people. It's a good thing this recording is sealed for the ethics committee, although if she were to petition to release it to the council, it would certainly raise eyebrows if she refused. Mallory says she's the worst, but Ten replies that she doesn't appreciate having the Black Moon invoked on her so frivolously. She's fond of Mallory, but that was insulting, and she has a bad habit of overstepping. If she doesn't do it again, Ten won't let on to the rest of the council just how good a detective she is. Mallory apologizes, but Ten says that that's not quite good enough. In return, she's invoking the writ of recompense, so that Mallory owes her a favor in kind to be fulfilled at a later date. Regardless, she's not sure what Mallory is going to do with the inquest from here. The Ethics Committee only has authority over special containment procedures and research protocols, not discipline. She's honestly surprised that whatever leaps of logic Mallory is taking are sound enough to keep the mandate in effect. Mallory mentions the first Ethics Committee review document, which states that special containment procedures must describe whatever measures are necessary to prevent further instances of SCP-5236 from manifesting in the future. In other words, if underhanded dealings and illegal narcotics usage led to the creation of the anomaly, that falls under Ethics Committee purview to prevent future similar anomalies. 0510 applauds her cleverness again, and the interview ends. In the analysis afterwards, Mallory remarks on her usage of the term Gias to refer to the Black Moon, which is a Gaelic term for a vow, generally magical in nature, that compels someone to do something. She notes to herself to stop getting so casual with the she, the fairies of Celtic mythology. 0510 has a solid case for claiming recompense under the old law and Mallory is probably going to be dragged into some inane O5 infighting and getting herself cursed. She'll have to get O510 a box of that tea she likes, or maybe an infant to devour, although she writes that that last one was a joke. As for the last two statements from them, in which Ten says the situation was well played by Mallory, and she replies that that means a lot coming from her, Mallory remarks that these are both truthful statements. Finally, we're given the final draft for SCP-5236, which has now been approved by the Ethics Committee. Sasha's name has been redacted from the document, and the description now mentions that the investigation has indicated 
that Sasha experienced a fatal overdose of methamphetamine and nestic drugs, the combination of which caused a physical manifestation of psychic trauma. The containment procedures mention that audits of employees' schedules and work hours are to be conducted on a quarterly basis, coupled with a random selection of anonymized surveys from employees working more than 50 hours per week. Labs found to be overworking employees are to be investigated for abusive working conditions, and employees are forbidden from working more than 60 hours in any 7 day period, as well as working more than 13 sequential days without a day off. An official Foundation Good Samaritan amnesty policy for medical emergencies will be drafted by the Ethics Committee so that any employee who reports a medical emergency resulting from the use of illicit narcotics is not to face disciplinary action. Disciplinary action is to be taken only when the reporting employee provided said narcotics, or was otherwise engaged in illicit activities. A program for esoteric drug rehabilitation is to be established at the Foundation as well, offered free of charge to any current and former employees. Lab directors or senior personnel found to be encouraging drug use among their employees, implicitly or explicitly, are to face severe and immediate disciplinary action. Using various narcotics to enhance your performance at a job is certainly not unheard of in the mundane world, and that's already a risky enough proposition. Combining mundane drugs with anomalous ones, however, is certainly a recipe for disaster, one that could pretty easily just erase you from this dimension. The anomaly itself really wasn't the interesting thing here though, as the interesting thing was what led to the anomaly's creation. It's somewhat surprising at how rough of a job it could be as a Foundation researcher, but it does make sense that they would be somewhat understaffed, considering the privacy and commitment involved in working there. The Ethics Committee used to be considered as more or less of a joke, as the Foundation was an organization that would routinely commit moral atrocities, but times have changed. Not only is the Ethics Committee an important and powerful part of the Foundation, they're a necessary part. Mallory and the Committee affected real, positive change here that wouldn't have happened otherwise, as the whole situation would have been swept under the rug. Sure, there weren't really any repercussions for the O5 council members that instigated the whole thing, but I'm sure the average Foundation employee is pleased that the committee exists. Well, most of the time at least.